Mr. Young, if we could start with you um, telling us your name and which years did you attend Linda McKinley and how old were you in 1971 and what year were you? Make sure I get it right. Yeah, my name is uh, Alfred Leroy Young. Uh, I went to Linda McKinley from 1969 to uh, uh, 1971, and I graduated when I was turning 18 years old in 1971. Okay, wonderful. Um, so as a youth, um, were you aware of, or how aware were you of the political and social turmoil that was happening in the country at large? And what were your thoughts? Well, all my life, uh, I grew up in a predominantly uh, white neighborhood, so for the first three years of my education, I was the only uh, uh, minority in these uh, elementary schools. Uh, I experienced a situation in 1961 after I left the uh, predominantly white neighborhoods. Uh, I lived next door to a gentleman who used to call us uh, names and kind of belittled us, okay, and... Uh, this is 1961, so one day uh, his wife uh, scheduled a meeting to meet with my mother, and my mom said, Miss Wilson's coming over. But all those years, we never knew that Mr. Wilson was a, a, a black man, but he was in denial. Uh, he called us all kind of names that you probably heard of in the 70s. Uh, a long story short, when Mr. Wilson died, uh, Mr. Wilson left his house, he left his car to me, I started taking care of Mr. Wilson after uh, uh, Miss Wilson died, and then I realized Mr. Wilson had accepted the fact that he was a black man, and uh, he had to just live with it and accept the people that was the same color as him, just that he was just a lighter, lighter black. So I kind of knew about that stuff, and then, like I said, my mom took care of a, of a, a judge, and in order for us to get back into the white neighborhood from the white neighborhood to our neighborhood, well, we had to walk through predominantly uh, what you call uh, uh, Italian neighborhoods, and they would run me and mom through the neighborhoods. And this was like 1959 through 1960. And then I said, my mother finally told the judge what was going on, and she started getting a cab to take us home, because my mother was a nanny. I don't know if you know what a nanny is. She ironed her clothes and took care of them. And, kind of realized it at an early age, all the way up until I was like in probably the third grade, I realized that this world was different, you know, it was different, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, and so then by the time you were in high school, how were you feeling about things then, and specifically about the things that were happening in 70, 71, 68, 69, 70, 71? Uh, when I left junior high, our junior high was predominantly black. I got to Linda McKinley, it was an eye-opener, because in 68, Linda McKinley was pretty much more white than it was uh, a black. Uh, so I got to Linda, and it probably was 80-20, or maybe 70-30. Uh, and then as it progressed, uh, the next year it went probably like 50-50. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And then my senior year, there was more African-American students, we called ourselves black at that time, than there was of white students. So that progress of, of over the years of going to a black predominantly uh, uh, junior high and a predominantly white uh, elementary to a predominantly 1971 predominantly black high school, it was, it was a culture change for me. Mm, I see, I see. Um, and when you looked around at the news and you saw what was happening, what were your thoughts? I didn't feel good because at that time, you know, the Vietnam War was going on and all the things were going on. And I uh, told my mom one time at church uh, I wanted to make a change. And the change was whatever we could do uh, because I know what my dad and mom went through and I just didn't feel good. So as I got older and smarter, I started putting one and one together and started helping not only myself but my family uh, and just got involved in different things. But at that time, there wasn't a whole lot for black students to do. So we went through our churches and stuff to really get our black culture and stuff. So 
I didn't feel good to answer your question. No, I didn't feel good about what was going on. So, did you want to learn black history and black culture? Well, uh, Miss Peters, yes, I did. And what I got was uh, I got wrong uh, information because when I started learning it, I learned it from predominantly white people. And they only told us what they wanted us to know. And as time went on, I, I met him, my uncle. My uncle went to a predominantly black college. And he started telling me the real about how things was and giving me books to read. And, you know, that kind of stuff educated me because I had the material to find out. Uh, that time the Black Panthers was on the scene and different things was going on. So I started reading and learning for myself about, you know, what it is like being black in a white world. So that's pretty much what I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about the changes that happened at Linden, in the Linden community while you were a student there? So in terms of the racial, I guess the racial makeup of the community and the school from the time you started high school to by the time you were a senior, how did things change or shift? Well, here's how it changed. From uh, 1961 until I moved off of uh, uh, 19th Avenue, the North area, we was the third black family that lived on our street from 1961 until probably 1965, somewhere in there. So I didn't see too many people of color on my street uh, other than when I went to uh, uh, elementary school. Uh, so, you know, th the time had changed because it was like I always was used to living around predominantly white people. And then from like 1961 until whatever, I started living around people of the same face as the same color in myself. So I had to make a, make a change. And I know kids used to tease me because they said, well, you act like a, a white boy. And I'm like, how does a white boy act? I don't know how a white boy acts. But it was this stuff like that. that uh, and so I had to learn. I learned, and, you know, like I said, when I went to Linmore and predominantly black students all were my color, I kind of learned. I had to learn how to walk and talk being black, okay? You know, so it was great. It was great once I learned it. Would you say that there was racial tension at Linda McKinney High School? You, you, it was in, from, uh, from 68 uh, through 69, it was okay. But then the next year, it started changing because there was more of us, and we was not going to allow people equal to us, other students, if you know what I mean, to disrespect us, okay? The teacher is fine because they're your teacher, but we can't allow you, same age, same height, same size, disrespect us. So uh, one of the things that happened, my I played football and ran track. We had a football game, so... We was horrible, Miss Peters. We was just horrible. And we played a predominantly white school. And just in the midst of the game, we heard this MF. And your mom, such and such. Next thing you know, a black guy is hitting a white guy. And there's a riot on the football field. And parents are screaming. And parents is trying to run. Well, you got to keep in mind, Linda McKinley was playing a predominantly white school. And at that time, there was, like I said, the numbers. But there was a riot on the field. People sucker punching white students, parents screaming and stuff. So uh, that there was a culture shock to me. And that happened in my uh, uh, 11th grade year. So that had to be like 69, 70 that I actually seen the blacks wake up. We started waking up. We started waking up and not allowing those things to happen to us, you know. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it was a big change in, in 69th and 70, you know? Yeah. And so when you talk about the disrespect, you're referring to whites not allowing white students to disrespect you. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about kids the same age. I mean, we took it from the teachers. The teachers were so disrespectful. You know, they knew our names. And they refused to call us by our names. Hey, boy. Hey, you. Well, my name's Al. My name's John. My name's Don. I don't care. I'm a teacher, and you will always be a boy to me. Okay, sir. Okay. You know, but we got to respect you. And a lot of times, if we didn't do that, we got sent to the office. So, you know, we was always taught to be respect, 
someone, they should respect you in return. It, wasn't, it didn't go on like that, you know. It just didn't go on like that. And can you talk a little bit more about that? You mentioned one incident when we talked about, um, you mentioned an incident where a white teacher uh, hung up. Yeah, there. this is the craziest thing. I don't remember if it was 71 or whether I think it was. Well, we had geography. It was just not, it wasn't a, a major, it was like the selective course you took just to accumulate uh, R's to graduate. Well, this guy had names for us. He called us all the guys chump punk kids. So one day, uh, Keith said, hey, Mr. King, I'm not a chump punk kid no more. He said, what did you say? He said, why do you wear white socks, man, with penny loafers? He said, because I'm a man and you're a boy and I can do. So next thing, we're, we're, we're knowing that Keith is up and Mr. King is choking him. And the next thing I see, Celia, Keith's head is hanging out the window. His head is literally hanging and Mr. King has his hands around his neck. I will kill you. I will do that. I'm like, oh, my God. So there was a few of us football players and a few other people. We had to pull this teacher, Mr. King, off of Keith. Because if he would have stopped choking him, he would have fell out the window. i never seen that in my life. I mean, just a teacher. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, ma'am. i never seen a, I never seen a teacher jump on somebody for whatever reason, and we didn't know what the reason was. It was just words. And next thing you know, he's has his hands around Keith's neck, choking him. And I don't know what ever happened to Mr. King, but that situation, it was just the start of me feeling totally different about these white teachers at Linda McKinley, man, you know. Were there any consequences for the teacher? You know what? I don't know. Because uh, after that class, I didn't go around Mr. King. I stayed away from Mr. King because I know the way I felt and what I wanted to do, but I, I didn't go around him. I, I didn't did go. You see, did I, you see him at the school anymore? I probably did, but I didn't pay no attention to him after I realized what his heart really was about. He was a racist. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow, well, that's horrible. Yeah, that's um, horrible. And it's so weird. That guy <laughs> called me. He's uh, he's in uh, stage four of cancer right now. We talked about that situation, and it just kind of, he you could tell his voice that he just relived that in his mind of what took place, you know. So, yeah, this that was a bad situation. And then could you also tell me about the, um, oh, good question, Alan. What happened to Keith? I mean, be, before, I mean, I know you said that at this point he has he had cancer. Uh, after that, was he? You uh, know, Keith was uh, pretty much uh, became uh, like a militant. <laughs> Keith didn't have no respect, no no, Keith was a good guy. He was born for a good family. I think Keith's mind kind of changed towards teachers, especially white male teachers and stuff. Because uh, Keith was a, a real thin guy, and he just, he wasn't going to allow that to happen no more. You know, you could tell that, you know, and it was just, Keith, we got you, man. We got you, man. So, yeah, it turned Keith around, yeah. I know it did. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, um... You mentioned also another time when a counselor said something to you about black colleges. Yeah, I... Uh, How did you describe that? See, this is so weird because I wanted to go to school, and I wasn't the smartest person, but I was smart enough. Uh, and so I went down to, uh, forget Miss, I think her last name was Williams, and I went in there and I asked her if you had any black literature on black colleges. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't support schools like that. We do Big Ten schools, Mac schools. Uh, I'm like, uh, I don't want to go to a predominantly white school. I want to go to a black college. Well, you're out of luck because I don't have anything. You have to do your own homework. I said, okay, okay, I'll do my homework. So a friend of mine didn't believe it. Well, he went down there and he said, what the hell is going on? You don't have anything about black colleges. So fortunate enough, we had family members who had went to historical black colleges, and they they turned us on to that. But my uncle was an administrator at a, at a high school, and I told him about it. And him and our vice principal was real good friends, Mr. Brown. And I don't know whatever came out of that, but that was just horrible to, to hear. 
that the only schools you can go to is predominantly white schools. And I'm like, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, um, it's crazy. So, so we get this picture of you and your, I guess, your awareness and your sensibilities shifting as a result of these these experiences that you were having. Yes, ma'am. Um, so then you were a part of a group of black students who wanted change. And yes, ma'am. You, you all sort of gravitated toward one another. Can you talk a little bit about who else was a part of this group and what what you all wanted? You know, what did you want to change? How did you want change to happen? Well, first of all, we wanted to stop being disrespected. Uh, we wanted uh, students of color, whether you were a female or male, to earn the respect that we gave the teachers. Uh, so what had happened was John Wells, Don Baxter, just to name a few guys, they were probably some of the smartest unknown students. Uh, John Wells was, uh, was given a scholarship to go to Notre Dame. Uh, after what took place with John Wells, I'm just trying to give you, uh, the counselor called uh, Notre Dame and said that John Wells was not the appropriate student for you to give a scholarship to. Who does that? How can you say that when he is a, a, a bright student? So as time went on, us black students, we started having meetings. Uh, some of the places that we had meetings was at my house. Uh, John Wells' house and some other places, uh, we had to be real careful, see, because there were certain things that we couldn't let our parents know what we was doing. But we gathered a bunch of people, a bunch of uh, females and, and males that felt the same way that we did. And we started learning more about black history and the things that we couldn't do. Uh, so one day we said, we're going to schedule a meeting with the teachers. Uh, we selected the certain ones to go into the teacher's lounge and ask uh, these, not demands, but requests of respect, okay? And that kind of snowball other things. We wanted more uh, black uh, culture in the walls, not all these white pictures of all these white people. We wanted to, it, it to be balanced. We wanted it to be balanced, okay? And... That kind of like started it all with these guys, and these guys and women were brilliant. Uh, uh, doctor, uh, you'll you'll talk to her. She's a doctor. She went on and wrote publications. Uh, so it was a bunch of smart people that knew right from wrong, and we wanted to make sure that we got what was right for us in our flight and made it would make it better for other students coming along. So that's what we did. We formed groups. We had meetings. We we just did everything. We had marches. We went we went downtown. We went to churches. But you got to keep in mind we we couldn't allow our parents to know what we were doing. So there were certain things that eliminated certain ones. Like Johnny Wells was raised by his uncle. His uncle was real militant. So Johnny Wells was allowed to do certain things a lot of us couldn't do. Him and John Whitaker and one you'll get a chance to meet them. So, yeah, that's basically what we did. Yeah, those are the kind of things that took place with those students. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so and I'm just going to ask you, when you're um, responding, do, you don't please don't say my name, just because when we when we cut it, it's, it's trickier to try to cut my name out of the Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. No, it's okay, it's, not, it's fine. I should have I mentioned that before. Sorry. Um, okay, but I mean, you're doing, you're doing great. Uh, this is great information. Um, Gary Davis probably was the first uh, person uh, other than Mr. Bunch and Mr. Hopkins that was the same color as us. Uh, Gary brought in what we needed. Uh, as far as black males, we needed to see someone that we could respect and look up to. Uh, we had a few of them, but Mr. Davis brought in what we needed, uh, the education of being black and living in the white world and being black and living in a black world. And Mr. Davis pretty much took a lot of us to the level that we needed to be at. He instilled the black anthem. He instilled black history. And he didn't just tell us what bad happened to us. He told us the things that we'd done to get to where we was 
up until 71. So, uh, you know, and I, after years went on, I became a director of a program, and me and Mr. Davis, he was a drug and alcohol director, and we became the best of friends. And what he taught in 71, he was still teaching, uh, but this population was men and women who were struggling with drugs and alcohol. So he was an educator. He gave you education and gave you a choice to decide what you wanted to do with your life other than just what they told you you had to do. Uh, so I think he was a, a positive figure. He was my football coach. Uh, you know, so I just had the utmost respect. He was the first one that allowed us to have a predominantly black play in high school. You know what I'm saying? Where when plays had to be more them and you had to – play like, I'm not saying Uncle Tom, but uh, more or less like a coon. I don't know if you ever read the book, Mulattoes, Coons, and Bucks, but that's what it felt like when you was in their plays. But Mr. Davis had a black king, a, 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 back, a black king, a queen, and it was just good to know that we could step out of being who we were and just be ourselves, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Davis was actually the black studies teacher? Yeah. He came my uh, senior year in 1971. Uh, that was my formal introduction to Mr. Davis. He was my football coach also. So I, I met him in 71. I think he came in 71. He could have came before that, but I met Mr. Davis in 71 through the course of all the stuff that was going on. He was the first black male history black study teacher, okay? <laughs> okay, yeah. And you mentioned something when we talked about him mandating respect in his class. Could you talk to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I thought I could challenge Mr. Mr. Davis. A lot of us guys that were a little bigger. Mr. Davis is a small guy. Well, you don't disrespect a black man. And you don't respect someone that looks like you. And I found that out the hard way. I didn't take a lot of this stuff because what I had been taught, and I didn't know Mr. Davis was that educator, so I tried him a couple of times, and I learned the hard way. I learned that uh, you don't disrespect a black man, especially when they're trying to help you, and that made me understand that Mr. Davis was real about what he was doing. Uh, I got sent to the principal. I got all the maters from Mr. Brown, and I wasn't about to mess up my senior year. I went back and I apologized to Mr. Davis, and I told him I would never do that again, along with other guys that was in his class. And from there, we really learned black history. You know, a, ter a mind is a terrible thing to waste. You know. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so let's go uh, to early 1971, and I know that you mentioned the play. Um, so can you talk about the Black History Week performance that happened in February of 71? And, and I, Mr. Davis was involved with that as well. But can you talk about the performance and what happened during that performance? Well, mine was short-lived because after all that, I was, a, uh, I was in a car wreck that almost killed me. So I was in the hospital for a number of weeks prior up to that play uh, with I had stitches and I had uh, plastic surgery, so I didn't get to participate as I wanted to. But uh, from what I knew, because I was supposed to have been part of the play, uh, Donald Vassar will be able to share more of that with you. Uh, but I didn't get to see a whole lot of that. What I did see with what took place during that play, uh, it was horrible. Um, I, mean, I couldn't believe that what Mr. Warren and the other gentleman did during that play. Uh, it was it was a bad bad day that day, man. Bad day that day, because uh, we was uh, doing our first black play and it was just a horrible experience. So can you can you tell us actually what happened and who who Mr. War Rick Warren was? Uh, Rick Warren. At first, I thought he was my friend, him and Denny. Uh, but as time went on, I guess Rick Warren was being educated too. Uh, what he wanted to be as a uh, as a white male. Uh, uh, Rick Warren had some flyers printed up by one of the teachers. Later on, we learned that one of the teachers that was working with Rick 
printed up some uh, some flyers that was very, very discriminatory, very racist. Uh, through the course of the event, Rick Warren came on the in the balcony area uh, during that play and dumped dumped hundreds of flyers on everybody that was in the bottom and then threw the rest of them through the back of the uh, of the upper level of the uh, balcony and they they ran and they had cars outside evidently because we couldn't catch them and stuff and that was pretty much the start of what took place you know uh, very it was just horrible it was just horrible because Mr. Davis was trying to you know kind of control it but you couldn't really control angry students because of what was written on that uh, it was just some bad stuff, yeah. Do you remember um, either exactly or in broad strokes? I know it was a long time ago, but do you remember what was on the flyers? No. Or what the gist of it was? But it was racist. It was racist. And I kind of probably blocked that part of it out of my mind. Yeah, because I, after being there three years with these two guys, you never thought that. And from what I was told from one of the a young ladies that Rick had been in a group, and this is what they were, I don't know if it was called uh, white supremacist or whatever it was called, but uh, she had told me years later that that's what Rick was about, and I never knew that. I, I never did, you know, but. And you played sports with him? Yeah. Me and Rick, we uh, played football and baseball mm, from the uh, 10th to the 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And were you aware Teacher, did you ever have any? She was a uh, she was one of those that you never would expect from because she was like the system, the uh, type of uh, white uh, administrator that didn't take any shit. Excuse my language. You never would have expected that from her. Okay, and once we learned she did that, let me know where she really was in her life. You know. Uh, so I, I never would have expected that from her, uh, to print the flyers up and be part of what took place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there any consequences for the teacher? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay, so we're going to move a little bit later into the year, to May. Um, first of all, uh, I did mean to ask you if you participated in the march from Linda McKinley High School on May 19th, uh, the march to Franklin Park for the rally to commemorate Malcolm X's birthday. My mom wouldn't let me. Yeah, see, there were certain things because the boundaries of to go there and the boundaries of how my parents thought, because they grew up in the in the 30s, uh, there were certain things, and I didn't. I tried to sneak out, but she wouldn't let me. Mom wouldn't let me. That's just mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a little bit later that month, um, there was a meeting at Bethel AME Church on May 24th. Did you attend that meeting? I was one of the people that stayed outside. I was like, I'm not going to say a doorman, uh, but we had a certain uh, plan of how we wanted this thing to be done, and we didn't want all of us in there talking. And uh, we only had certain ones like Johnny Wells, John Whitaker, uh, Miss Diggs, and certain ones to present what we wanted to, to go on, along with uh, the uh, people that was there, Reverend Dowdy and uh, the other gentleman that was supposed to be pertinent people in the north, north end area. So we stood outside to make sure nothing went down. I was one of the soldiers outside, if you want to say that. Okay, and mm -hmm. so what was... What was the message that you wanted, the, the, the ones of you that were inside, what was the message that was to be given? But I wasn't, I wasn't inside. Uh, the message was what we're going to do uh, about the flag, about uh, trying to make change at Linda McKinley to leave some type of everlasting effect on students coming. We wanted to bring an awareness of, of what was really going on at Linda McKinley and we wanted to do it the right way, and we thought by taking the flag down, by trying to change the name of Linda McKinley to Malcolm X High, that those things were appropriate. 
But a lot of us knew uh, that if you take down a United States flag, there's consequences behind that. Uh, you'll talk to a gentleman here sometime real soon, and he'll share his stories of what took place with that. But those were some of the things that we were trying to get, and we wanted to get the community to be a part of. We want the reverend, we wanted the leaders in the North End to rally around smart students. Students that never been in trouble, students that made good grades, we wanted them to support us. And that's what we would, you know, we knew them because a, a lot of those people were parents of students that went to Linden. You know, so. So there were parents, there were parents and students. Yeah, the, yeah, and a lot of these, yeah, and a lot of these people knew most of us because we grew up in the Linden. Mr. Lumpkins knew 90% of us. And he was the main leader in the Linden area. And you hear his name a lot when you talk to other. Mr. Lumpkins knew a lot of us, okay? Because he lived in the neighborhood. Yeah. And that would, that would be Clarence Lumpkins? Yes, ma'am. And can you talk a little bit about him and his involvement in the community? Mr. Lumpkins probably left more of an impact in the Linden area than anyone that I can think of other than the... Uh, uh, the sports programs, uh, but Mr. Lumpkins probably brought more grant money, more stuff into Lynn McKinley. Him and Mr. Ma Ma uh, Mr. Maloney, uh, they brought money. They did things that took the gateway of uh, Linden to another level. Uh, he was just a trailblazer in everything that he did. Uh, you know, helping uh, us, helping the the poor. He. He was like a, a, a uh, North End Martin Luther King type guy. You know, he didn't believe in no violence, but he believed in having his voice heard for the right thing. And like I said, uh, that's what I remember about him. You know, if you never heard anything negative about Mr. Lumpkin, he was always fighting to get money. So then the, as I got older and got into the, we were part of an empowerment zone where poor people lived and there was like, a need to help and those are the kind of things that he knew about that we didn't know about as kids growing up so yeah and he was at that he was at that meeting as well yeah mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and when you mentioned being a, a soldier you were outside that's a what term it's just a term i was you making okay. sure yeah okay yeah so i mean but what was it that you were outside doing? what what did you who did you want to keep out well we I were mean, told was, by certain people that uh, the city hall knew about it. Uh, the uh, other administrators downtown knew about it. The, the chief of, uh, of uh, the fire department and chief of police, they knew about what we were trying to do. And we wanted to make sure that if they did show up, you know, we had to alert the other people inside, especially us, you know, what was going on. Because we were told that they knew about everything and they were sitting, they, were, they was going to be sitting two or three blocks away when this thing went down and stuff. So they knew, the, uh, the the fire department, the police knew about all this stuff that was going down. And when you meet with Mr. And Brown, he'll, he'll, he'll share that with you. And when you, when you say they knew what you were trying to do, what was that? What was that? Well, the biggest thing was when they said once we took that flag down, that was that was crime. They was going to be there, so they uh, they put some stuff. There was two flags at Linden, one on top of the building, and then there was the flagpole. Well, they laced that pole with some type of pin, a pig skin, where you would slide down it once you tried to get up. So they did things to prevent us from taking that that flag down. So yeah, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And trying so to put a flag. Hmm? Yes, ma'am. What, what happened after? Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What happened after the meeting? And and when did you and your friends, or how did you decide to take action that night? Well, like I said, that was leading into going back to school, okay? So uh, Johnny Wells. Uh, Mr. Brown will share the story. Mr. Wells, uh, Mr. Brown was uh, uh, in the back of the school, and he had warned Mr. Brown of what we were going to do. Uh, and so from that meeting, we had told them what we was going to do. 
and Johnny had made Mr. Brown uh, aware of what was going to be going on that day, and that's when it went down, you know, the flag and all the stuff that took place, yeah. Well, so, can you talk, but, so, so just imagine that you're talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about this. So, tell, mm -hmm. so walk us through what happened after that meeting and what happened with the flag. Well, the meeting basically was what I said it was. It was going to be letting the people know what our plans was going to be, and we went to school, and that's what took place. I mean, like I said, I wasn't allowed to be too much part of that because I had a, I had like a, 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 a problem with e e eternal bleeding. If I got hit or if I got bumped, my nose would bleed. So I wasn't allowed to participate in too much of that because of what I was scared of that was going to happen to me. Uh, so that part of it, I knew it happened, but I don't know how it went down. You would have to that would you have to go through Don Vassar and, and John Whitaker and Johnny Wells. They would have to share that portion of it. Uh, I just know that uh, from talking with Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown knew that that day it was going to be going down. The flag was coming down, and everything. And so, were you, were you the, at what point um, did you see the the red, black, and green flag up on the pole? At the point of when the uh, riot patrols came in, the riot patrols came in, uh, and after what took place, uh, the riot actually went down. That's when I came out of the corridor. I was pushed out of the corridor, and I was trying to make sure the doors that Mr. Vassar had locked were still locked. But when I went through the corridor hallway, Mr. Brown was laying on the floor. And that's when I seen Mr. Brown, and I'm like, yeah. They, I, I don't know what had happened. From my understanding, Mr. Brown was struck and had knocked him out because he didn't have his badge on. Uh, so I was, we was forced to go to our lockers. Uh, the riot patrols were in there, and they was like, it, it was just horrible. And I couldn't get my locker open because I was panicking. I was panicking because I was worried about people in the group. I was worried about people in the group. Uh, unfortunately, my friend came and then guy, first thing he said, uh, he said, nigger boys. Oh, you big nigger boy. My friend was like 6'3", real big. He said, get this damn locker open for him. And he's like, who are you calling that? And he said, you heard me. I'm a countdown. He gave us a countdown. And if you don't get this thing open up, he said, I'll break it off here. So he finally got it and was there because we had the combination locks. You got to go one way and the other way and the other way. So we was forced to go to the north side of getting out of Linda McKinley. And when we was forced to go out that way, that's when we seen uh, my friend who was being abused by maybe four or five police officers. And he was body slamming them and throwing them all around. And I'm like, oh, my God, Albert. And next thing I know, they brought him down. They brought him down face first and put him on the ground. And we're going through here. And we got out. When I got out, I noticed I made a quick turn. It was up. It was up. And this was the mm. next day. Yeah, yeah, it was up. And so, and so um, I want to go back to uh, what before the police came, right mm -hmm. before the police came. So was there an assembly that day on May 25th? Yeah, I, you know what? I don't know how much this was assembly because that's when Mr. Ross, Dr. Ross, I don't know how much of that really, really went down because he was there. And he was speaking, and next thing you know, it's police is there. It's like this man didn't know anything about it. We didn't know anything about Mr. Ross other than what we had heard on the news. And but next thing you know, it's, it's chaos. And I'm, I'm thinking people think Mr. Ross, but it wasn't Mr. Ross. It was chaos. But he happened to be there speaking about what I don't know. You know, so you don't, so you don't, you don't recall what he was talking about. Do you recall when the assembly started, and if it was uh, any of your your comrades who called the assembly? Oh, you're speaking of the assembly that uh, Johnny Wells and a bunch of other people had. Uh, they wanted all the blacks. Yeah, uh, that was the, that was Johnny Wells, uh, John Whitaker, John Harrington. And some of the other people that was mandating they had wanted everybody to come down. Yeah, that 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 assembly. And that's when he showed up. So I don't even know 
if someone knew him and invited him, but that was for the black students and anybody of interest. And he shows up. So I don't even know how he got wind of what was going on unless someone knew him. Because I know Mr. Davis wouldn't have done that. So I don't know. I don't know. So the, so the assembly itself, though, was to address, was it, I mean, what exactly was John Wells and John Whitaker and... And the other group members, basically what we've been talking about here, trying to bring the awareness and to let them know what was going to be going on. Yeah, the activities that was going to take place. Yeah. And, and so then Mr. Ross showed up and he was also addressing the crowd. Yeah, Mr. Ross got arrested. <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think back to that, how, because he was supposed to have been speaking and they said he did, but I don't know how much time he spent up there talking because everything happened so fast. You know what I'm saying? All that event happened so fast because he was up there and next thing, you know, chaos is breaking out. So I don't know how much speaking Dr. Ross actually did. And I can't remember because he wasn't part of anything, you know. So when he, you know, he wasn't on our agenda. I see. Yeah. Was there a point when the announce when the principal made an announcement about um, about dispersing about students going back to class and other people leaving the building? Do you remember that before the police what, came uh, or not? Or what day? That day when 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 uh, uh, Mr. Ross was there. Mr. Reed, the Mr. Reed, our our our, our head principal, made an announcement. Mr. Brown was the main player with the black students, so I do remember uh, uh, Principal Reed saying something. But didn't too many people listen to Mr. Reed? Uh, Mr. Raw, uh, Mr. Brown was was who we felt comfortable with. Uh, Mr. Reed did make an announcement. I I don't remember exactly what the what he said in that announcement. Just the normal standard, you know. Yeah. So. And, and yeah. do you remember um, when the police came? Where were you? Were you still in the auditorium? Were you out in the hallway at that point? Yeah, I I, I was in the hallway at that point. So I was in the hallway, like I said, trying to uh, keep from my nose from bleeding because uh, I had the put galls in my nose, you know, and, and, and move them every so often. But I was in the back of the uh, school trying to get into my locker, and that's when my friend came up. And I don't know if they were riot patrols or whatever, but they had belly clubs and all this. And I'm like, what the heck? And it was get out, go to the north, and get out of this building. Yeah. Can you describe a little bit of what you saw beyond the interaction that you had with the person who, who, you know, used that language with you. But can you describe what you, how you saw the police interacting with the other students? What was happening in the hallway? Yeah, uh, I tell you what, I got out because I, I figured I was going to start bleeding. When I got out, my grandmother lived right across the street from the school. So me and my friend uh, Ricky Lane was able to see people fighting, police jumping on, uh, on, on students. A lot of stuff went down. Uh, you know, students fighting the white students. So we was able to see that being uh, right across the street from the school. Uh, there was a lot going on, a lot that was unnecessary. Uh, and I didn't... So can you, can you be a little more detailed? It was what I call a, a, a baby riot, a dam against us. White students fighting black students, black students jumping on white students, police jumping on on, on students, uh, people, what we call sucker punches. You could see all this going on. People running. People was more in panic. There was more panicking going on. But like I said, there was a lot of activities that was going on in the, the what you could see from just certain areas. But from what I was told, uh, other friends, and they'll probably share that, they was fighting. Uh, a, a police officer jumped on one guy, and John Whitaker uh, offended. And it, it, it was like you'll hear these stories coming from the other guys that were actually involved in what took place more so than I did during that day. Uh, John Whitaker, okay. you'll be able to share that story with you. John Whitaker and Donald Vassar and John Wells. Okay, so you're saying that 
Yeah, because I, I had to be removed from the school and go towards, uh, like I said, to my grandmother's house. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then can you tell us what was the rest? I know that was toward the end of the year. What was the rest of the school year? Like, did the, was the school shut down? You know, this is so weird because one of the ladies that was supposed to be a part of this, uh, so, uh, she sent me something, and it was senior day. Because we didn't know there was 500 some seniors that supposed to graduate. And they had senior day. And senior day was you could do whatever you want to, but you couldn't be at the school. But we as a group of, of 1971 didn't know that there was going to be a separate going on at a park. And when I seen this picture, the picture showed all the white students with the Columbus City bus so they got there by a Columbus City bus and it was all white students, maybe one or two of us, but they was at a senior gathering and there was only maybe one or two and there was no uh, black students there other than those two. And this was senior day. So I'm like, what is going on here? And Rita said that they had not invited us. And I'm like, wow, they had not invited us to that. So... And was was that an official school? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was our senior day. Like, yeah, it was an official senior day, uh, that seniors could take off and get credit and have to be there. But if you showed up to the school, you would. They would give you a write up. You weren't supposed to be on. A, well, we didn't know anything about a, a senior get together for the class of seventy one. Well, they got together at some park, and it was all white students and maybe a couple of us. You know what I'm saying? So you you can see how it was how it was being played out. If it's senior day, why aren't we all together? Yeah, you know that. Did, mm -hmm. did you ask Rita that when you uh and, this, and you're referring to Rita Daniels, your classmate? Yeah, Rita was in my homeroom for three years. And I probably did, but I can't remember what Rita said because Rita was more shocked of, of how that went down. Uh not a racist bone in her blood. And she was probably more shocked uh, of how it went down, but she went to it. Mm. I, I, I don't how know. How did you feel about that? Well, it just let me know that all the stuff that that we did and all the things that we had went through, we was pretty right on point. You know, uh, not only were they, we were educating ourselves and getting becoming smart, but they were doing the same thing because the 70s brought that out. You know, you got... Uh, you you got the the riots that took place in in, uh, in California, Cleveland, the Huff riots, uh, the uh, college thing that took place in Ohio, Kent State, the shootings. Everything was starting to really come come around. You know uh, the hippie era, the Black Power, and all that stuff. That era was coming right there. And when I went to college, I told people, and they said, like, you know, you was living. In 71, the start of the hippie era, the black power, the Muslims, you know, all that stuff was starting to develop right there in front of your face. It was right there. Right. Yeah. And, you know, actually, since you say that, I do want to go back to those moments inside the school when the police, mm. the, during the police raid. And I, I want to ask you, looking at all of what you were looking at and seeing what you were seeing, how did you feel in those moments? Honestly, I felt bad, but I felt good because Lyndon, a few students have, were able to create something positive, but then at the end of the day, it, be, it turned out to be something negative. Uh, I felt good, but at the end of the day, I didn't want to see it materialized like that. It never was plans to have the police come in and do and say whatever. It never was about that. So, and, you know, like I said, half of me was feeling good, but then the other half of me was sad because students that didn't know anything about it were probably being attacked because of the color of their skin or whatever. I felt bad about it. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I felt bad. And I think it was totally misinterpreted by uh, people of, of, of uh, position, authorities and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Were you afraid? 
I wasn't afraid for myself, my health purposes. I was afraid, but I was afraid for students that didn't know anything about it, like the younger students, the 10th graders, uh, people just coming to Linden. Yeah, I was afraid for them because, you know, I ain't never seen, there's an incident that the uh, state highway patrol showed up at our school. For what reason? I have no idea. And when you see that as, a, as someone in the 10th grade, a younger, they're kind of like, you know, you want to go home. You call your mom or your dad and say, can I come home or whatever? So that was like, I don't know why they was there. I don't know what generated the state highway patrol and the, all these uh, officers and men in uniform to show up at Linda McKinley and all, you see all that stuff in the back and all that. Uh, I know I talked to a friend of mine, Eddie Ponder, so he was shocked. He was ready to go home because he's seen that. What is this about? You know, yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I you know, yeah. I, I felt bad for, for the students that didn't deserve anything bad to happen to them. Yeah. Would you, is it fair to say that this incident, uh, well, first of all, were there other times that police came, you know, between, say, that period of the beginning of 71 to, to May? Well, the football game, uh, like I said, there was a riot. Uh, black students jumping on, not students, but jumping on parents, breaking out their windows, trying to turn their cars upside down. Police showed up. Um, the police showed up. Well, you got to realize one thing during that time, uh, Mr. Brown told me the police was always in the area uh, because there was a meeting be between some administrators, uh, fire chief department, uh, chief of police, they were like in the area. So if you walked certain ways, you would see them because we all had to walk to school. There was no busing. So they was in the area. They was just hiding out, waiting for just that moment for something to go off. And they was there. Yeah. So, I mean, they was there. I mean, but when you see them in numbers in the parking lot around the school, you're thinking like, what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a culture shock there for me and for any other. Uh, how did you feel as a student seeing that, being aware of that? Well, I felt good for one part of me because our group was making some kind of change here. Our group was really doing something. But, of course, when you're dealing with students in that time period, black, and you're dealing with something like that, First thing in their mind, something bad is going to happen. But it never turned. It was never supposed to have been something bad. It was supposed to have been something positive change. And white society, as older I got, I realized that that's how they interpret us during that time period. You know, uh, Marvin Gaye's music was out. You know, uh, and all this stuff was going on during that time period. So yeah, yeah, it was horrible. I mean, not for us, but for People on the outside that one part of our group probably thought it was bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so can you go back to the, the rest of the school year? Um, what was the like? And you were a senior. So yeah, well, what was graduation? Uh, well, first of all, we were told we wasn't going to graduate. Woo-wee. And that's when I finally had to tell mom all those meetings that was in the basement and, of course, she was going to have dad with my you-know-what. But I had to tell her. I had to finally, because I am I was born in the church, and, you know, when you grow up in the church, you don't do nothing bad. Well, I had to tell her, and then that's when she said, if you don't graduate, A, B, C, D is going to happen. So for the longest, we didn't know if we was going to graduate or what was going on. Uh, I panicked. So I went on, and I took my ACT test. Thank God I passed it, but you still didn't know what was going to happen. So that Saturday, I took my ACT test. And as time went on, we finally, they brought school back. Uh, Warren, he was uh, transferred over to Brookhaven. Some of the students that were involved, white students, went to different schools because they were seniors. Uh, so I was scared. I was scared because three years, uh, I didn't know it was going to lead to uh, not graduating, 
And that's where it was. And like I said, at the end of the day, 417 students walked that day when they had the graduation out of 500 or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how the events that happened that year um, affected the rest of your life and your pathway? Well, let me say this to you. I was enrolled to come to Ohio State, and I was going to play football. I went out for football, and I met this guy, man. I had heard about this guy, Woody Hayes, and he was like a a racist. And I had dealt with this growing up in Linda McKinley. And he was a diehard racist, and I'm sorry. And So I went to uh, my biology class, and I, I had... I'm like, where is the teacher at? The screen came down, and it was like, you make appointments. And I'm like, make appointments? I need to have a teacher here. So it was like 300 and some people, 1971 in this class, and it was like, most of this stuff is going to be done on yada yada. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. So I called my mom, I called my uncle, and I said, Unc, I got to get out of here. So thank God I discovered a historical black college because I had submitted to uh, Tennessee State, Howard University, Central State, Wilberforce, and Central State accepted me and they accepted me to run track and play football. And my life was changed. When I hit Central State, they met with all the uh, black athletes and said, we're going to teach you two things here, that how to be a student, but how to be a black man in a white world. And I'm like, wow, what does that mean? And they said, by the time you're a senior, you will understand what we were talking about. I I was saved. And everything that that I had taught myself and people had taught me, it came reminiscing around by going to a black college. The black college showed me that you can be black and live in a white world and be successful. Got my degree, I, I, I did well, and rest is history. So I was thankful that I had to go through these periods of the 50s, the 60s, and 70s, but at the end of the day, it led to me discovering you got to accept who you are and be proud of who you are and not let people, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it helped me a lot. So I'm sorry I'm rumbling with this, but it just helped me. Yeah, it just helped me, man. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Um, so if we can just bring it to the present, um, can you tell us what your thoughts are on the demonstrations that are happening now in response to <clears throat> police brutality, racial violence and aggression, um, you know, the things that have really unfolded very intensely this year? Even. Well, you know, I got to start off with one thing. Um, with the culture shock was me. I never thought my my uh, sons would would date uh, women of different colors, but they did. And out of that, I, I uh, have two granddaughters who are biracial, and my oldest is thirteen. And the biggest thing that's coming out of this that they have taught my oldest granddaughter to accept who she is, uh, because for the longest uh, she said, "Papa, why does?" White teachers always pick on black students when it's Black History Week. And I, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, she doesn't ask anybody else to do anything about black history other than black students. And I said, do you have? She said, yeah, Papa, because I know who I am and what I am. They need to know. So it was like I was glad that, that it was coming around. She was accepting that she was a, a black person. Uh, and then it helped my other granddaughter, who's eight, to understand that you are black. And I love what's going on because when I was growing up, I was part of like all that stuff. When I left Lennon, I got in some other things that I don't want to talk about. But what's good about this movement now, it's more of them in some cases and maybe less of us. It's more uh, students of, of a different color. It's just not African Americans. It's everyone. And I love it. And that's the way we wanted it to be when I was coming up. And I'm loving this. I'm accepting this. I'm hoping that they don't do a whole lot of just protesting. 
They need to do a whole lot of voting. They need to do a whole lot of asking for results because if you don't plan, you plan to fail. And I hope they do planning so they won't fail because this can really be something. It's not about being a Democrat or a Republican. It's being what's right, and I love it. I love it. I just love this movement here. I really do. Uh, you know, like I said, when I worked, I was a director of the largest uh, uh, reentry center in the state of Ohio, and there was more black men. Uh, they used to always say one out of five, but when I left, it was four out of five. Uh, black men are incarcerated, and I couldn't allow that on my shift. So I, I did a my reentry center was based on education uh, of them learning who they are with cognitive uh, behavior, thought processes, and stuff. I taught these black men how to be black, and you got choices. You don't have to always go out and rob someone, even if there is three strikes and out rule in this society now. So I taught them how to utilize their thought process. And for 35 years, that's what I did. And, you know, you know, I, I can guarantee I probably helped over. When I left, the mayor gave me an award that said uh, Alfred Young has helped over 10,000 men and women through his fight of reentry into uh, Central Ohio, and I was glad to see that. That was I was more proud of that because it's never been about me. It was always about the men and women. And one thing they said, he never said anything negative to these men and women. I never did. Everything that I said to these men and women, whether they were black, white, or whatever, was something positive. And this is what I'm loving now. Because the truth will hurt, and the truth will set you free. Everything that's going on, it's been going on. So I'm just hoping that we don't stop and we keep it on what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, it's got to lead to something positive. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I guess, yeah, you brought back some memories for you, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Alan... Did you want to um, did you want to talk about uh, the reading? I, I didn't pick up that thread when he mentioned um, reading some stuff, but I didn't know if you wanted to, to talk to sure, sure. sure. Actually, just a few things, too. So, sure. um, Mr. Young, can you hear me and see me? Yes, sir. How you doing now? I'm, I'm doing well, brother. And I have to tell you, you know, this was really a powerful interview. I was sitting back and, and listening. I'm kind of managing the Zoom stuff. And I listened as you went through, and you have such a powerful narrative. And I really loved it. I mean, this was a great interview, too. Right. And as you continue to work through, I mean, you said so many powerful, there were so many powerful, like, poignant moments throughout. And you said something. I just want to share this with you. First, I want to say to you, I just started working um, up at um, uh, a prison up in, um, what is it? It's London, but it's right across the street in Madison. Yeah, I Madison. Yeah, yeah. Regular, regular, regular Woo. Regular. I just started Black History Month. I had a former student who, who works there. Yeah. brought me in, and we're going to continue to work. So for, I just want to say to you, thank you for your service. Cause yeah. Yeah. All those lives, that yeah, you yeah. And people get back on track, and you know they lose their voting rights. They're getting disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Hope, yeah. Ride. That's probably, and I'll never forget you. By the way, we were sitting next to each other in the meeting, and you almost smacked me in the face like three times. <laughs> so I'll never forget. Oh wow! <laughs> but I'm just kidding. Now you were talking with your hands, and it was fun. But what I want to say is, I, I genuinely want to thank you for that because I think that's such a powerful work. And then you talked about, you said it wasn't about you. You know, 10,000 lives, man, that's that's a great life's work. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks, man. I think that really matters. It really does. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single life, and you know how many lives they touch, right? Woo. So, I'm sorry about that, but that was powerful. And then you talk. Um, I want to tell you that I think that I came, like, right in the generation behind you. And you talked about, in a lot of ways, my journey is unbelievable. Yeah. You know, predominantly white schools and elementary school, which was culture shock. You become bicultural. Yeah. You spent a lot of time in black neighborhoods, and you had black folks calling you white boy because of the way you spoke, right? Yeah. And so you talked about that. And then you talked about getting to high school and playing sports and making friends across racial lines and then getting close. But then in your senior year, finding that somehow – these folks changed. Yeah. The folks you thought you were close. It's the same thing. It's amazing. Yeah. And it, 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 it really, really is. And I think that your story will speak to generations of people who have it. And then I played ball in college, same kind of thing. So that, that journey, right, really resonated as you talked. Yeah. And I want to go back to just a couple. Sorry about that. I, I was really caught up in your story. 
I want to go back to just a couple quick points, okay? Yes, sir. So you talked about, I believe it was an uncle who went to an HBCU. Yes, sir. And you were hungry for knowledge about black history and culture, and you couldn't get it at your school, and you reached out. You, you did it yourself. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Can you talk just a little bit more in descriptive language? Like, take us there with you. You reach out to your uncle, tell us about what school he was at, what you remember, yeah. and what he recommended. What books did you read, and what impacted those specific works happening? Uh, my uncle Miller Barnes was uh, an administrator here in town. He was probably was one of the second or third uh, black administrators. Uh, Miller Barnes started in the 60s. He ended his career at Beechcroft High School. Now, you don't hear this. This is unnormal. Normally, vice principals don't stay at one school, but for only a few years. Miller Barnes lasted 20 years at one high school here in Columbus. That's a historical thing. Miller Barnes was at uh, at uh, at uh, a, a junior high, and my uncle reached out to him and he said, "Hey, Al's having problems. A lot of the black men are having problems uh, trying to go to black schools." Well, Miller Barnes was a legend at Central State Black Historical College here in Ohio. He uh, told us as long as we scored a 16 on our ACT that we could come and go to Central State. And at that time, this is amazing because tuition was only like $6,000. That's unheard of. And uh, so I ended up taking his lead and doing what he said. And I had my coaches uh, sent tape. And I got to go to what I, my dream was, an all-black school, a black college. But when I got there, they were doing the same thing. They was bringing in white students to try to make Central State a, a, a school of more than just all black. And that's how I learned from Miller Barnes. Miller Barnes, you know, Miller Barnes gave me a book one time, and my dream was to be an actor. And he said, I want you to read this book. It's called Coons, Bucks, Mulattas, and Nannies. And I read that, and I'm like, my mother was a, a nanny. My mother was a nanny. And I cried, man. I cried, man. Because kids used to call me a mama's boy, but my mother's walk was she ironed clothes for white people. And one day my mother said, enough of that. And she went to school and got her uh, a little uh, vocational degree and then lived the rest of her life working at Ohio Bell. My mother didn't graduate from high school, okay? Keep in mind. My mother taught herself, and then she went back and got her high school diploma and worked at Ohio Bell. Okay, that's unheard of. My father worked at the post office. That's unheard of for blacks during that time. So uh, after I read that book, I said I didn't want to become a buck and I didn't want to become a coon. I didn't want to be called, and that time we called them Uncle Toms. So uh, after I read that, that was enough. And then when you read, there's the Renaissance period. The Renaissance period where you have people like uh, Bill Bone, Jango Robinson, Paul, uh, Paul Robeson, okay, Hattie McDaniels, Butterfly McQueen. These were people that I looked at, okay? I looked at, okay? And I wanted to be like, but these people played a role in society where it wasn't accepted by us because Stephen Fetchett was considered Uncle Tom, but Stephen Fetchett was a millionaire. You look at the lady that discovered hair products. She was the first black female millionaire that we ever, that knew about. So when I started reading about all this stuff, I knew I didn't have a problem with being black no more. I educated myself through listening to my ministers, my uncles, and other people. And I, I wasn't going to be no Uncle Tom because they said a mind is a terrible thing to waste. You know, to be young, gifted, and black, that's a fact. Okay, young, gifted, and black is a fact, okay? And when I heard that, say it loud, you're black and you're proud, those are the kind of things that I found at a black college. And I self-taught myself along with listening to adults. I had a plan. I didn't never plan to fail, and that's, that's what I did. You know, uh, my major was communications in school, and I, I met people like Joe Black. I met people that were uh, Jane Kennedy, I met these people. I worked two years with one of the number one motivators in the country, Les Brown. Les Brown taught me one thing, never be ashamed of who you are. And 
That's what I did. I followed his lead, and Les Brown, to this day, I talked to Les Brown, and out of 10 kids, man, 10 of his kids are motivators in the country, the number one motivators in this country, if you ever look at Les Brown's history, if you're familiar with Les Brown. So that's what I did, sir. That's excellent. That was really powerful. I just wanted mm -hmm. to give a little break there so they can edit out before my sound comes in and still get everything you said. And next time you talk to Les Brown, tell him I said, what's up, A5, because he's a fraternity brother. All right, now. And I looked up to him for years as well. Mm -hmm. You see him on TV and everything when mm -hmm. he had his show. But, mm -hmm. Right, so really powerful. That's really cool to share. There's just a couple more things I wanted to ask. So you talked about many of the things that you read and how you kind of auto mm -hmm. You taught yourself in, in mm -hmm. college. Even in college, you pursued knowledge on your own. So there's two more things I want to ask you about. So I want to ask if there's any specific works that come to mind. You, you shared a few already, but I just want to dig a little deeper and say, were there any specific works that came to mind that when you read them, they, they affected you? They were in some way related to your choice to get involved in activism or change. I'm wondering if that exists. Was there uh, the history of uh, Huey P., P. Newton was one, uh, and then I read the book on the Black Panthers, uh, you got to realize, during my period, uh, Central State had one thing that a lot of people didn't know. We had people br brought in. We had, uh, we had uh, the gentleman just died um, having a senior moment. Uh, what is his name? He just passed. Uh, John Lewis? No, not John Lewis. Uh, he was a comedian slash uh, a black, uh, and he invented, the, oh, he just passed. Uh, kind of reminded you of, of Booker T. Washington. Oh, having to see your mom. Well, anyway, we had people of uh, prominence come in and they spoke to us. Uh, and uh, Dick Gregory was one of the biggest ones I can remember during that time, Dick Gregory. And he came in and then we had, uh, we had the last poets. We had Gil Scott Heron. And they came to our school. Now, I don't know if you guys old enough to know who Gil Scott Heron is in The Last Poets. Well, my best friend's sister was Angela Davis. Okay, uh, Peter Davis uh, and uh, her, his brother and Angela, I met her. So she actually came to Central State and her brother went to Oberlin College. So we got to meet, meet her and we got to hear, hear her, okay? So you see what I'm saying? You got Last Poets, you got Gil Scott Heron, you got Dick Gregory, and then Angela Davis. And Angela Davis was at the peak of her her life during that time. So when you start hearing that from these people, you go like, hey, this is real. Yeah, this is real. So, yeah. I want to jump in. Mm -hmm. Did you think about your experiences at Lincoln? Oh, you had to. Yeah, you had to because if you ever listen to that, during our time, black people put their sorrow and their, their life through music. If you ever listen to Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye tells a story. Stevie Wonder is the greatest songwriter ever. So we listened to that. I sung in the largest black gospel choir in the black history during that time period. So all our songs was about our struggle. We competed against black colleges and we came here and tore Ohio State up every year. We competed against other black colleges and all black music was about the struggle of black people. So when you hear black music, you know the struggle. And our choir director said, do you know why we sang these songs? I'm saying because we got to, but no. It's the struggle. Listen to the words. So it was like, you know, just the, the words of black music during that time gave you an idea of where you are and how much further you need to go. I wasn't there just because I went through Lyndon McKinley's thing, but once I graduated from Lyndon McK I mean Central State, I was ready. I was ready. Central I mean, I don't know if you know anything about black history or, or black colleges. It's just... It's a struggle to stay in school, to get through a black colony, because they don't want to see it happen. Central State was the predominantly the only uh, black college in Ohio, so they always was trying to shut it down during my period. 
a time, so they didn't want to give us money. So when money came that way, they would always give it to Wright State or University or Dayton or, or Wittenberg. They never wanted us to get state money. So you had to keep a certain grade average in order to help Central State because the grades determine how much state money you would get during that time. So, yeah. I was, that was really powerful. And mm -hmm. I got to tell you, too, I, got to, I was fortunate enough to get to visit Central State and do a couple lectures up there. I mm -hmm. got to go there and then across the road to well before. Oh, yeah. The... So I kind of got a bit, I have visuals to go along with the story you're telling. I want to talk about two more points really quickly while I have you, right? While we have you kind of talking about this moment. You talked about the, the, your journey in the church, and you talked about mm -hmm. how that was important to you. And I, mm -hmm. get, I guess what I really want to, I, I want to just, I'm wondering here if, if any of if, if your... Um, thinking about the impact that your experience in the church is having, right, mm -hmm. as you grew up as a man, and then, mm -hmm. were there any things that you read there, or any um, things that might have been read to you, or in sermons, that affected your activism as well? That's what I'm searching for. I'm wondering if there's any connection there with your journey in the church and things that you read and studied, and if that led to your involvement in activism. Like for me, there's a life verse that I never forget that I did learn in the church, and that was envy not the oppressor and choose mm -hmm. none of his ways. And that stuck with me a lot. And it, it really taught me that even if I face discrimination mm -hmm. and racism, these are not the things that I can practice. Yeah. Right? Uh, my, that sticks with me. Yeah. My journey in church was uh, probably the, the most unique experience because I grew up in church. Uh, as I, I joined church in 1963. I was baptized. I was the only, the last group of people baptized in the Ontangy River. Uh, got baptized in 63. In 64, I became an usher. An usher is like real important in the churches. Uh, so that year, when I became an usher, my culture to the black churches just totally changed. Uh, I was not only an usher, but I was the president of the youth ushers. I played the piano. I was a child prodigy, but I won't go into that with that piano. But I learned more in my journey of being in a black church than I did anything because in the black church, the education that you get is it's written. If you read the word, it says in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But people don't realize God is the beginning the middle and the ending, you know, he's alpha and omega, you know. So I didn't know what all that stuff, but when I started reading the Bible and not just like listening to my pastor, you know, I understood for myself. So the Bible itself tells you what your journey is going to be. Uh, you know, if you don't follow the Ten Commandments, honor thy mother and thy father, so thy days will be longer upon this earth. Uh it was an easy read. You know, if you read Psalms, you read anything in the Bible, it gives you a written history of how your life can be, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think the Bible, uh, uh, as kids used to call me and my brother, mama's boys, but I didn't care. I knew how to sew. I knew how to stitch. I knew how to do everything. I knew how to change oil, but I was a mama's boy. But I think the Bible, the Bible kind of gave me... Uh, my education then my cousin who uh, was a muslim kind of brought it to light you he brought it to light the quran once i i started listening to him in, in my bible uh, i kind of kind of like those were the things that got me embedded into the person i think who i am today also those readings yeah yeah the bible is yeah I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, you're all right. But that's it. I, yeah, I was going to say that was really powerful. That's interesting, too, because that was a part of my journey as well, mm. you know, studying the Quran mm. as well. And I, I did that, too. It was really important. But so the reason I brought up that specifically is because you talked about growing up in the church and how it affected mm. you. But then when you described how you guys organized this, mm. it was a lot like what we saw in the Civil Rights Movement. Like we studied black history. Mm. And in the way that you guys use the church as a gathering place mm. and, and you had certain kinds of activities, even you standing as a soldier outside, mm. reminded me of the things that I saw you know in the civil rights movement and mm -hmm. i wonder did you guys intentionally model your actions after that you know what john john and, and don bassard model a lot of that stuff after the black panthers and and uh he put newton's walk and they kind of like 
these guys were beyond their years, man. Uh, I talked to uh, our vice principal, who was a good friend of mine, Mr. Brown. Now, he said that based on what he knew as an administrator, Lyndon had more uh, professionals and more people graduate in 71 than any high school in the city during that time. Uh, a lot of people don't know one of the biggest players in the city was the superintendent who graduated with us. She became a superintendent. You know, doctors, lawyers. So our class probably had more professionals that graduated during that 71 period than any other high school from what Mr. Brown, because Mr. Brown stayed an administrator until like 1999 or some crazy number. But that, that just let me know that a lot of those kids, were we were just smart and we embellished and we, we not only listen, but we was always taught in order for you to be smart, you got to be able to listen before you can talk. And that's what we did. We listened. We was great listeners during that time. And we were like a sponge. Say, yeah. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. I mean to interrupt you. I wanted to, to allow you to kind of really complete your thought. But um, I think that you guys, you're clearly a leader. You keep talking about that. And it keeps coming up when you step to the front. And you guys really, as a, as a unit, I think did something really powerful. And I love the way that you did the reality that so many folks who were in that class who were a part of this. Mm -hmm did so much with their lives. I think that's hard to escape. I want to ask you, this term keeps coming up, like we talk about the Lyndon McKinley protest, right? When you think back about it, and this is just silly, this is really in my head, and I'm wondering about this, you know, you guys put up the Black Liberation flag and all. If you had to put a term on it, what would you call it? Was it unrest? Was it a protest? Was it a riot? No, to me, I, I called it the beginning. The beginning of... See, people don't know, man, it is if you grow up doing, if we grew up doing what the times that most of us did, we had a beginning, we had a middle. It's like writing a story, like writing a story. You have an introduction, you have a flow, but they didn't understand that what you was teaching us, we was absorbing that. And it was like a new beginning. It was our new beginning. We was coming out, man. We was coming of age, man, and. They taught us all this stuff, but then when we started using it, sir, they didn't like it. But you taught us to be smart. You taught us to recognize what's wrong and right. And we knew this, but it was a bad timing, sir, because the timing that we utilized, it was the time that the world was just like going crazy. You got you, you got the riots. You got all this stuff going on, you know. Uh, you know, everything was going on in the 70s, man, and the Vietnam War, and it was just a lot going on. And I think our timing was good, but it was bad because now you got high school students doing what you read about, you know, what you read about. And you're, we're not supposed to do that until you become a man or a woman. But we was doing it in high school, man. I think that's how it, people perceived it wrong because we're not ready to come of age yet you don't come of age until you get your high school diploma or your first job but we was coming out we was coming out because of what what we were being taught man and i don't think nothing's wrong about that i'm sorry mm -hmm. no no i'm sorry i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off i just as i've been listening to you and listening to you know Alan, those are really amazing questions because it really is painting this picture. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, one of the first times we talked and you mentioned being the third black family to move to 19th Avenue. And coming from that and that experience of being in environments as a kid, as a small, a younger kid, when you were the only black person around you, to then coming to Linda McKinley, which itself was in the midst of this, this transition. And then the, the things that happened there and your awareness, because Although people may have seen your actions negatively, the bottom line is even though you weren't adults yet, you were still experiencing right. the racism. You were still experiencing yeah. the bigotry. And then to take that and go on to an HBCU, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and have and had the opportunity to go to a Big Ten school and choosing to go to an HBCU. Mm -hmm. My mom went to Howard for undergrad and medical school. So yeah, she's a bison she was a bison. And then to do the work that you did, that's an amazing, mm -hmm. that's an amazing arc. You know, it's that kind of arc. It's just, you know, that's, you, with all of the lives that you've been able to touch, 
you know, think about how all of your experiences contributed to that. Yeah. And you know, the biggest thing that made me aware of what I did when I, I grew up, the other blacks that when they moved in, you ever been around Jehovah Witnesses? Oh my God. And I grew from a, uh, I grew up in a typical uh, uh, Baptist church. And that made me understand that uh, Jehovah Witness, Baptist, it was like, it was really a, a, a frightening experience growing up because we had the Jehovah Witness telling me and my family that we were sinners, but we go to church, but we're sinners and we read the Bible, but there's Jehovah Witness. So it was like, it was like, me and my brother talked about this the other day. It was like a crazy time growing up. Because you got an old Baptist and you got Jehovah Witnesses. And they was like, where are these people coming from? Where did they get that we are not saved and we're not? So, had a like on-the-job trainings growing up. You know, growing up during that period. OJTs and stuff, boy. Mm. Mm. Well, um, Alan, if you, because we're at um, uh, 11.25 now. So, we probably should wrap Um if you don't have anything else, thank you. Mr. Young, thank you so much for, yes, ma for sharing all of this with us. We really, really, really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, Absolutely. And Mr. Young, I just, I just want to second what Celia said. Thank you so much. It was really just wonderful to, to listen to the narrative that you shared. It was powerful. So yeah. I, I hope we get a chance to talk again. In fact, I'll, I'll make a point to follow up. To make sure you do, because I, uh, uh, to this day, I still work with the feds. Uh, we have a contract. Uh, I, I started a program with uh, past, uh, Pastor Fitzgerald, Donald Fitzgerald, and uh, we still work with feds coming out of uh, the federal prisons. Uh, we do mentoring once a month. So once everything gets, uh, you know, all this goes by, I'd like to talk to you about becoming part of that group, man. Uh, we have a grant for like $75,000, and we work with men that need help once they get here in Franklin County and Central Ohio, and we work with them trying to make sure they're doing the right thing and stuff. Yeah. 